if you really want to boil it down to the simplest things, there's stingy and there's thuddy. And stingy feels cutting, um, almost like like you look and you're like, am I bleeding? Because <laughs> that was a lot. And thuddy has weight behind it and it hurts in a different, in a deeper way. You feel it more in your body. Welcome to Love Link, your guide to love and sex in all forms. We're your hosts, Simone Humphrey and Sina Simon. Our guest today is a sex educator, storyteller, and the creator of Sex at Agogo, a live sex Q&A talk show performed regularly in New York City and taken around the country. She teaches sex education at conferences, universities, and you can find her behind the counter at Shag, a sex shop in Brooklyn. In this fun and at times provocative interview, Lola teaches us all about kink and BDSM, what it means to experience pleasure through pain, and the potential for empowerment and healing and submission to a partner. She shares with us her personal journey of discovering her sexuality, sex ed growing up in the South, how she cultivated her own body and sex positivity, and her introduction into kink and polyamory. We're so excited to welcome Lola on the pod. All right, so welcome, Lola, to the pod. Hi, thank you for having me. Thanks so much for being here. Yeah, Hi. welcome. So, you are a sex educator. Yes. Tell us what that means and what you do. Ooh. So, for me, um, sex education is, I take a more edu- edutainment, which is entertaining while educating. So, that's more of what I do overall. I do workshops and things like that sometimes, but it's not as fun for me as putting on some type of performance in teaching people. Um, I also work in a sex shop, and so that is a lot of um, dealing with the general population of folks and just giving them sometimes rudimentary anatomy information. We get people who come in because we get a lot of people from the Hasidic community in our particular store. Mm, where is um, your store? In Williamsburg. Uh, so What's yeah. it called? Shag. Shag. <laughs> Shag. So we get folks in who are like, I don't know what a clitoris is, and you're having to like, ha- okay, like have a whole body conversation. So it goes anywhere from just like anatomy lessons all the way to like tips and tricks, all the way to like let's break down materials for your flogger and like why you would want this over that, or oh, you're vegan, let me find, I can find you like 30 things in this store that's totally for you that isn't leather, because everybody thinks kink is everything leather and stuff. Um, so it's just disseminating information for me in the funnest way possible. Um, so I they also, come in for a sex toy and they get a free class. Right. Amazing. Right. And we also do little <laughs> workshops there and stuff. And um, I also do a show called Sex at a Go-Go. And it's a sex ed Q&A and go-go review. So we mix uh, go-go and burlesque in with sex education it's not really a class it's more folks get to come in and they get to ask us whatever they want to ask us so they write their questions down anonymously so nobody has to raise a hand um, which means we get lots of really in-depth like sometimes people give me three slips of paper <laughs> where wow. they've written a whole thing but we get a lot from people because they don't have to talk out loud right. so we try to create that like safe space container in a bar so it's this like, oh, you're coming in for a show and you're gonna see a panel of folks talking about sex and laughing and then you're gonna see a little go-go uh, or burlesque in the, in the middle of it, but then we're really gonna like get to the nitty gritty and answer your questions. And what are some of those questions, what are the most common questions we you're We get getting? a lot of butt stuff questions. <laughs> how do, how do, and, and the, my most hated word in the show is convince. I hate that word. Convince? Yeah, like, how do I convince my partner? And I'm like, well, we don't convince. We talk about our desires and explain why they're important to us and why we would like to try them and that we would like our partner to participate. Mm -hmm. There's no convincing. Mm -hmm. It's a good clarification. Yeah, Yeah. well, because it's such a thing of, like, you're not trying to trick a person into doing something. It's like, hey, I'd love to try this having that conversation of like, what's your apprehension around it? And nobody ever wants to ask that question. There's never the like, why don't you want to do this? Or or that there is that question of why don't you want to do this? But there's no in-depth like, well, tell me the things that are maybe frightening you about trying this or what are your worries about doing this? Like a curiosity. Right, right. And I think also, especially with butt stuff, there's always this thing of, 
I always tell people penises are never the first thing you put in your butt. It's just that's like step three. <laughs> <laughs> What's step one and two? Step one is fingers with gloves, mm. so you don't get hangnails and weird, you know, things that scratch and hurt and are sensitive places. And it's outside of the body, massaging the muscles and working your way in. Step two is toys and like starting very small and working your way up. And then a penis. It's like is like the last step because you've gotten used to it because you're working out a muscle I use that I always tell people it's like yoga you know you you start a yoga class and you're not very limber and maybe by like your fourth or fifth class you realize like oh you can move a little further than you could before you can stretch in a way you couldn't and it's not that your muscles got loose or they stretched out and your arms got longer it's that you're providing new muscle memory to your body and you're stretching it out and warming yourself up. It's the same thing with, mm -hmm. you know, the anal muscles. We have, it's a ring of muscle and it just needs to be stretched and warmed up and awakened. Right. And even then, it may not be something people enjoy, but. Do you think that you get a lot of butt questions because it's, people think it's more taboo? Yes. It's like the the it's the place we don't talk about but i'm like but why so many people have anal sex so we have like an entire market for anal sex and it's not just gay folks it's like everybody it sounds like what you do a lot of is also shed the stigma around yeah. these conversations or that it's normal that it's normal because people will yeah. whisper people are in the sex shop like hi so and i'm like we don't have to do that we don't have to whisper i like will say pussy or dick or whatever and I use I use a lot of anatomy in order to um, not use binary language because we're I'm been working really hard to move away from that because everybody's like what are your men's toys I'm like whatever everything in the store could be used on a penis it's just pink and maybe not your jam because it's pink but you know everything can be used pretty much everybody can use things like all the butt stuff it might be shaped more to reach your prostate but everybody has a butt and everybody can put it in their butt <laughs> so it's mm. you know people get so locked into like this is for me or not for me right yeah I think so many of us are conditioned to be so ashamed to talk around about these topics and it makes me curious about I mean what your sex education was like oh. and how you became so comfortable talking about sex oh <laughs> <laughs> I so I grew up in South Carolina and our sex education consisted of being separated in what, like the fifth grade to talk about getting our periods. Um, and I remember being very like curious about what the boys got to talk about. Like, what did you talk about? We talked about this, but what did you talk about? I was also that kid that found porn magazines early under my grandfather's bed and would read all the dirty like penthouse forum letters mm -hmm. and things and so I learned about the word cunt and got very excited that that had an, another name <laughs> and went to school and started asking kids like what do you call yours I was that that You're a kid. provocateur yeah. child I was because I was very curious about sex and part of that I think is because I did have some sexual trauma in my childhood that made me hyper curious about sex things and like wanting to know like okay because I've one of those people experience trauma you also experience pleasure and so there was this thing of like I know this is not good but also post all this stuff there was this pleasure stuff like I started masturbating really early which also was like a part of when you go through childhood trauma so it was a lot of like I'm having these feelings and every I can't talk to anybody about it because it's just going to bring up all the trauma stuff for them and I'm probably gonna, and I felt like I'd get yelled at which I'm who knows you know um but there wasn't a space to talk about like that it also felt good mm -hmm. so I think I started seeking out and being curious about that stuff really early and also it opened that Pandora's box of like oh this is a thing that people do and I got put in that kind of grown-up category of like oh sex is a thing we do way too early and so it just made me curious and so I just anything I could get my hands on I was a big romance novel reader when I was like 10 <laughs> like you know you go to the library you check out all the like Harlequin novels and mm -hmm. stuff um but yeah I've just always been curious about sex always read anything I could get my hands on and I don't know I've just always wanted to know what other people thought about sex or what like 
why don't we talk about it? It's always felt normal. And I guess going through that so young, it was like, okay, this is a part of my life. And I don't know if it's a part of everybody's life, but now I want to know things. And clearly there's stuff happening and we're not talking about it. What's all the things? I, I just want to bring it in. So I have no idea. I'm a Leo. That's the only my only answer for why <laughs> I'm okay talking about things is I'm a Leo and I like to talk about whatever and was there a person who like was the first person you felt comfortable talking about sex with? Cuz I mean, I remember as a young person being in sex ed and it was very fear-based yeah. and it wasn't until maybe I don't even know, college that I that I met somebody where I felt like okay yeah now I can talk about sex was there a moment where you felt like okay now I have permission to really talk to somebody about I think high sex? school for me well moving to New York um, I moved to New York my sophomore year of high school so moving to New York became this big like oh wow because everybody's very like oof in the south you're very in a box and I also was living in the rural south. <laughs> So it's like oh, even worse. Extra. Extra. But also like I was, I, that, that whole thing about like kids get pregnant because there's nothing to do. And I remember being at parties in middle school and kids are having sex because there's nothing to do Friday night after the football game, except for go in somebody's car and you'd be sitting there while your friend is having sex in the back seat, and then you get driven home and it's like, okay, good night. And you know, it's, happening even though parents are saying no and on Sunday everybody's going to church but then somebody's pregnant in high and like middle school high school um so it happens when you say abstinence only. Right, right right and then moving to New York I think just it was just this I won't say sexual awakening but there were just more kids like me so like I was going to sex parties in high school we would like half days go to a friend's house and watch porn or G we watched porn or we watched Angelina Jolie movies and, <laughs> and we did same thing yeah <laughs> we watched Gia and we watched Original Sin mm -hmm. and we didn't have like discussions about sex but we would just like experiment with each other and I was out in high school as bisexual and I like had friends that wore dog collars. I dated a girl and a guy at the same time. And it wasn't like we were sitting at a table going, this is what we're gonna do. It was just kind of this accepted thing. Like I didn't, a lot of kids weren't out, but they were. It was like this kind of unspoken thing. Like we had a special group with a teacher that we would meet up with and people weren't saying I'm gay or I'm this or I'm that, but we would wear the rainbow things and we'd all go to pride together and it wasn't this huge thing. And a large cross section of kids came out after high school. So like I still keep in touch with a lot of people from my school. So it was just this. Was it a progressive high school? Or it was, was like a newer high school in Queens that mm -hmm. had opened up and I don't know if it was necessarily progressive. It wasn't like we had special classes. Right. I just, I don't know if it was just is so many different types of kids from all different walks of life and there's so much more there was so much more for us to be in your new york city in new york yeah. city right and like everybody that's like our one defining thing is everybody's curious about sex mm -hmm. so that was a point where finding a lot of people on that same page that you're like oh i want to do this with and spank and whatever and like just try it out and yeah. I mean, I think that speaks to the importance of finding community. Right. And yeah. feeling like I'm normal, mm -hmm. you know, normalizing all of these things. Yeah. Because when people sit alone and don't have that sense of community, that's when the shame really sets right. in. Yeah. Normal and safe that you trust normal the people safe, that you're yeah. with. Because when you're feeling safe, that's when the experimentation happens. Yeah. And like, I didn't get called a slut until I was, well, after high school. Like, I didn't get called a slut until it was like post high school when I was still, same proclivities of like experimenting with people. But now it's like the wider world and people are like, what are you doing? Oh, she's a slut and things like that. And so I didn't have like that kind of bullying sexual experience in high school. People might talk, like, there might be, like, little whispers, but nobody was, like, mean or, oh, like, now, wow. Like, I'm like, wow, if you went to high school with us, I don't know, we wouldn't have been safe. Maybe it's the internet, I don't mm. know. Maybe people were talking about stuff, but they weren't saying it to our faces. Yeah. But it was just a way different experience. So that must have been a hard shift to go yeah. from being really accepted about your sexuality mm -hmm. and your sexual appetite to then suddenly being made shamed or bullied. Right. 
which then became this thing for me that when I found a person that I was really into, it was like, oh, this is why I've been slutty. This is why that I've always felt like I never wanted to settle down with one person and all these things. And I was like, oh, it's like what they tell you that, you know, you'll be normal and less slutty and not kinky and all those things if when you find that person to love. And that worked for about six years and then I had an affair and then it's a long time yeah and I hit I had a quarter life crisis where I just broke down crying and I'm like I'm not who I'm supposed to be like this Mm. isn't me at all and so I rediscovered and started really delving more into kink and ethical non-monogamy at 29 (laughs) so Ah. like there was like this whole decade of like dormant yeah monogamy and not being kinky and just quote unquote normal and did your partner go on that journey with you for about a while we're going through a divorce now um because they've decided they want to be um monogamous uh i don't know what they're bent if their you know ideas about kink has changed that journey they weren't they kind of explored with me a bit but couldn't quite wrap their heads around it and I'm also super impatient and like very pro- process very quickly and know what I'm looking for. And so I think we tried it and he was very like, I, I'm not there. And so I just started seeking out other people to fulfill those things with me. Um, so yeah, like I didn't really start being kinky until I was 30. Mm. And that was where like all of that. So it's like eight, eight years, I just turned yeah. 38. So yeah so what is kink Kink. what is and what drew you to it yeah okay (laughs) let's get into it (laughs) so basically kink is like a whatever non-conventional sex practice which that kind of shifts and changes as we go along right because for a very long time like there was like missionary and maybe doggy and maybe maybe like one other sex position on top like cowgirl that was like these are your sex moves so anything outside of that started becoming i guess kinky people would be like oh you're into kinky stuff because you want to like have sex in your kitchen or you want (laughs) to do things um but also kink is like you know practicing bdsm any parts of that um some fetish so i always tell people not all kinks are fetishes but all fetishes are under the umbrella of kink so it's it's kind of whatever's not conventional but in 2019 a lot of people do practice like some sort of impact spanking things like that and so spanking has even kind of become this thing that's not quite kinky right unless you're doing it a certain way um or i'm trying to think of what another thing that is less like blindfold stuff like that people mm-hmm. are like oh that's not really kink because mm-hmm. you can like get that anywhere 50 shades of gray also changed that i think right from kink yeah. To yeah. yeah yeah so there's things that are like now kind of seen as vanilla with sprinkles and mm-hmm. less of the kink variety um and like but bdsm is still pretty solidly kink so that that's a bunch of different things so it's bondage discipline submission sadomasochism and dominance so the letters stand for a whole bunch of different things it's like you can string it together however you want to um but that's just a huge umbrella it covers relationship dynamics within kink it covers acts within kink so like bondage um sadomasochism so people who enjoy pain and enjoy giving pain and and receiving pain and then like the kinks that might surround that um and a lot of kink is psychological and has nothing to do with pain or touch um all of my major doms in my life uh have been long distance and uh i didn't i still am in contact with one of them we've never met in person and it's been years we've been talking for a very long time but I've practiced kink with people who I've never been in the same room with. Mm. So, so how does that work? So it's a lot of mental stuff. It's a lot of phones are amazing. Um, but coming up with things like my very first dom um, when I was wanting to explore and he was a lovely man who was like, I want to help you find the kind of submissive you are because there's so many different ways to be submissive. Some people will tell you different, but there's different ways to top or be submissive or bottom or 
you know, all those different things, be a dominant. Um, and one of the things I had to do every day was send him a photo of my outfit of the day, a photo of me and my underwear of the day, and then a nude photo. Um, and so, and it had to be delivered by a certain time or there was like repercussions to what was going on. And I had to also send in my schedule every week. So this was before Google Calendar <laughs> or before I really knew and started utilizing Google Calendar. So like I would have to give him the rundown of like, here's what I'm doing or where I'm going to be. And so he'd go, okay, so when you're at work and on your lunch, I want you to do like X, Y, Z or while you're working on this report you have to do for work I want you to put bulldog clips which are those really hard paper clips with the, like the black part mm -hmm. on my nipples mm. while I work and it was like a whole thing so it's a lot of like uh giving assignments giving things getting visual proof um some of my punishments were like I had to write lines um, like you would have to when you were in school. So I'd have to write, but I had to handwrite them and I had to number the pages and write certain code, like coded things on them so he could see that it was a different page and not me just like erasing it. And, mm. and I had to write it in pen so I couldn't erase it. And so there's diff so many different ways. And how did it feel to go through that process? Oh, it was freeing and confusing and also helped me figure out the kind of submissive I am um, like I don't ever want to be 24 7 which is somebody who's practicing it's part of their everyday all day life I'm just not I don't want I don't like people telling me what to do most of the time so it felt like it was too much yeah well because it was a lot of me not feeling like I didn't have control over my day because it was like oh I gotta do this now for this mm. And it was multiple tasks in a day and like from sun up to sundown down to like saying good morning by a certain time and saying good night by a certain time and having to let him know if I was going to be out of range of being able to do these things. And it's a lot of, I guess, forcing you to make a schedule for yourself. But for me, it became this thing of there was no room for New York life to happen because, you know, things pop up in the blink of an eye or something happens or somebody wants to go out for drinks and he may have assigned a thing and then I'd have to be like, well, this person, won't. well, he was like, you didn't tell me about that. So it was a lot of those things and it helped me learn who I wanted to be with in this very mm -hmm. quickly. Um, it also helped a lot with my self-esteem because sending pictures to someone when like, I think back then I could barely look at myself in the mirror fully without clothes on and like to have to send someone pictures of yourself naked uh and I remember that first time it was such a struggle and I cried mm -hmm. and he was like why are you I can tell you've been crying why are you crying and he's like it's because I'm like I just don't like the way I look and he's like but you know this isn't about you I like the way you look and that's why I asked you for these pictures mm -hmm. and down to like our very last times together like the last picture I sent him he sent me back the set and he was like look at you then and look at you now and your body hasn't really changed that much and I'm like standing tall my hands on my hips and I'm smiling and it was like a completely different person from like point A to point B wow. and so it helped me like in a lot of ways find find myself be happy with myself be be able to look at myself and see the beauty that others could see in me because people I was like oh you know you can't see yourself through other people's eyes and I'm like sometimes your eyes are fucked up and you need to <laughs> look at yourself through other people's eyes that's a really beautiful journey yeah, yes. to go through yeah. With somebody yeah and what do you think it was about because there's this aspect of being controlled mm -hmm. that seems like it was also really empowering yes yeah just not making decisions it's nice sometimes to just let go and not have to decide what's happening in the moment and for somebody else to be in charge and it's also just an exercise in that sometimes control is stopping you from getting you where you want to be mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. when it comes to pleasure right. um especially coming from like a trauma background uh my brain wants to go a million places except for in my body and so kink was a way to focus uh, pain is a way for me to focus. Um, I didn't have feeling in my nipples for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And when I started, I was like, well, you want to do a lot of things with my nipples, but I don't, I don't feel anything. Like, it doesn't feel good or bad. And he was like, oh, you'll feel something if you put these things 
So I was, I learned about banding, which is like putting rubber bands and wrapping them around really tight. And it's like, yeah, the blood flow leaving your nipples and then suddenly coming back in, you're going to feel something. Mm -hmm. And that started, it was just flicking that switch in my brain that had been turned off Mm -hmm. by what I had gone through and I didn't know how to access it. Mm -hmm. And so kink started helping me access all those things that I kind of buried and hadn't dealt with. And it was helping me kind of refocus. Mm -hmm. Really push you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because you are going to work through it one way or another, but also with the person who, if you're with the right person, because not everybody is helpful like this, because I've had my share of like shitty tops um, who were hurtful and did probably did more damage than they did good. But with the right person, you can like deal with a lot of stuff. And it is a big exercise in falling apart and having somebody help you like get pulled back together mm-hmm. um and it's trust like yeah. i don't know if you do the enneagram but i'm an eight and eights don't trust anybody we mm-hmm. have big trust issues and it's a thing i know about myself but it was really like you don't want to do this because you don't trust this person that they're going to keep their promises or that they're not going to hurt you um there's a lot of fear in that and so it teaches it taught me that i to put my hands in the right people's hands like and they won't let me fall but also learning that not everybody who says they're a top or a dom is gonna have those you know guiding hands some people are not Mm -hmm. you know they kind of hide within the kink a lot there are a lot of Mm -hmm. abusers and people who are shitty within kink so you have to kind of be smart about it so how do you know like for somebody who's um interested in bdsm Mm -hmm and they're with a partner how do how do how do you establish that trust yeah and how do you know if somebody is trustworthy yeah um <sighs> big question it's yeah. it is a big question <laughs> i think it's a lot of being patient mm-hmm. and if anybody is ever rushing you completely into like a protocol so a protocol within kink is like like right now i have a daddy um and I don't always call him daddy, and we're not always in protocol, but when we are... What does protocol mean? Uh, it's like, whatever your things are. So some people do high protocol, so it's like, I always call him daddy. I wouldn't call him by his name um, if I'm typing to him, capitalizing. And you establish this at the forefront? Right. You would establish those things. And, like, we don't have any high protocol things, but there's things that, like, he knows I'm mad if I'm not calling him daddy. He can always, like, oh, I must have fucked up because you're using my real name. Um, mm. And, or just, like when you're in this realm of maybe playing with each other or practicing so for us uh, i have a collar that he puts on and i know that i know without a doubt we are in that in daddy mode and so everything he's doing is part of you know him getting me ready for whatever he's planning um but there's a lot to, to do before you get to that point with somebody and there's getting to know someone and getting to know them just on a regular human level and liking who they are as a human. And then part of it is feel. So as I've gone along, I always say like, I can feel, I, I, so a person will make me feel submissive. I, I will naturally feel a way around someone who's just giving off that energy and not trying to like give me instruction or make me do something there's just a way where i just uh, immediately will acquiesce because it's i'm i'm feeling that energy from them so anybody who's just immediately like well i want you to do this or touch yourself or you know blah 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 and they're giving you orders and you don't know you don't even know their real name that's a red flag um anybody not interested in knowing you at least as a human or knowing your past like knowing your stuff, like somebody who's, if especially when you're gonna do anything with pain, um, like any kind of impact play, things like that, people need to know your triggers. Like I have a trauma background, I have to talk about that. Like I have to, um, I get into moments where I am having a, I will have an episode and I have to like say, hey, I like gotta tap out. We have like our safe word and all those things. Um, And yeah, like having someone who, is interested in knowing those things and knowing the stuff about you that may cause an issue or problem or even if it's like health stuff like anybody trying to rush past any of that it's a big red red flag 
Um, so it sounds like some of it is listening to your intuition, but also building and cultivating a relationship yeah. with the person before you enter a world of BDSM. Right. Or and sometimes you can find events where people will be. Um, it's I don't know, it feels like a kink carnival, but it's not really. But there'll be uh, different clubs, or I've gone to conferences where the dungeon will be set up, and there'll be people who are have brought all of their spread because they would like to play with different people. And you can walk up and be like, "I'm a newbie," and so you're not entering into like a relationship, but you're entering into like a temporary contract of like, "I would like to play with you," or "I am super curious about the things you have," um, and I like those spaces because. There's usually a, a DM or dungeon monitor who will come over and like um, check the person's kit out. So like the first time I did needles, which was uh, somebody made a pattern in my back using needles and there's different gauges and you get different levels of pain and it was always a thing I said, oh, I'm not gonna do. And then I was like, oh, I'm curious. I might, might wanna do this, uh, but I knew nothing about needles and it was great. Somebody came over, they looked over the kit, they were like all the safety stuff, they asked them all the questions that I wouldn't know to ask. And then they were like, okay, cool, you can go and like play. And so, I did the whole thing and the person was really great because I was like, I've never done this before. And he's like, okay, well, what's your pain level? And I'm like, it's pretty high. Um, and he showed me all the different things and he like explained like, well, the thinner it is, the less it'll hurt, the thicker it is. And like, he just walked me through it. And then we decided on a thing that I wanted to do. Um, and then he's like, well, okay, well, let's talk about safe wording and things. And I'm like, here's the thing, I get really high and I get my pupils blow. My pupils blowing is a thing you need to look for because I will go past the point of being able to tell you I can't trust myself because I'm so high and it feels so good, I won't stop. Mm. So when my pupils blow, that's a good time for you to, to end things. Mm. Um, and since I can't see my own face, right. right. What an important conversation to have. Yeah, because it's just the thing, it's I, like, the drugs your brain releases is really real. Yeah. And I get very euphoric and very high and it's, I just, it feels good to the point of like, I can't say like, oh, it's too much. And so I've just learned that's a line. I Let's stop that at there. Yeah, can you tell us a little bit more about the kind of um, relationship between pleasure and pain? Yeah, so for me, it's, oh, so like if I stub my toe, that hurts. Like not everything that happens it feels good it's like oh gosh like if it's a surprise i wasn't prepared for it um it'll hurt um period cramps hurt <laughs> like there's yeah, not yeah. like i'm like oh yeah. yeah no um but there's just for me this meditative thing about knowing something's coming your way um and ramping up from like a late hitting pinching some kind of pain and all the way up to something more heavy um, and like that exercise of moving through all of that and experiencing all of it. And it's almost like an endurance thing because a lot of times you're like, okay, this hurts. And you're having this thing of like, do I want to say for it out or do I want to keep going and see where it takes me and like what's coming up. And it's just, it's just the way my brain works. It's, it blossoms into this wonderful thing mm -hmm. and and sometimes it's like I will go through something that feels so like I'm struggling to get through it but what's on the other side is like just this fucking amazing feeling of like I'm flying and I feel just like a new baby like I want to be curled up and wrapped in a warm blanket and talk too nicely and, and is that feeling coming after the pain itself yeah yeah, and sometimes during, like, it dep if, depending on the session. Um, and for me, some people mix their pain with their sex, and from, that's different parts of my brain. It's like left brain, right brain. So I need it to be in a certain mindset to be experiencing pain. If we're having set my br sex, my brain is somewhere else completely. And so if there's pain introduced in, like, a hard, heavy way, it'll snap me out of the sex stuff. So, like, finding that balance. Like, I have a partner now who enjoys inflicting pain during sex. So we've talked about, like, what's okay and what doesn't pull me out of sex stuff and what will pull me out of it, where I'm just, like, frustrated now because I feel like I've started all over again mm -hmm. for my orgasm, but, you know, there's there's different things, and it's different for everyone. And do you orgasm at all when it's just the pain, no sex? Not in the way, not in, like, a clitoral kind of 
oh my god this is an orgasm way but i experience a level of pleasure that is akin to having an orgasm so the way you feel after you have like a really hard good orgasm is how i feel after i've been beaten that same kind of like oh my god this is so like good rush, lightheaded high. i need yeah. to like you want to maybe fall asleep for a little bit you yeah that that comes and a lot of times if i'm doing a really good heavy pain scene i don't even want sex because i'm such it's that same spent feeling like my body has already gone through that the the roles of having it even though it wasn't like that kind of pleasure it's a completely different type of thing and how do you want to relate to the other person yeah afterwards like do you feel pulled oh, to yeah. be with them mm -hmm. or, or like okay, yeah. yeah so for me that's usually why I, I like to play with people i know and are okay with like aftercare being with a lot of touch because there's a lot of me just wanting to like curl up and be in a person like be as close as humanly possible to them um sometimes i'll cry i've cried after because it's just an overwhelming um feeling like sometimes a lot of emotions will come up sometimes if i've had a scene and it's been a hard time or a hard week or something's gone on it'll bring out like the tears and so like the crying um if i don't get that i can feel very disconnected and almost like an icky like i don't like this it makes me grumpy to not be able to be close and i like being warm because <laughs> i get i start shivering and yeah so it's like i want to be near them i'd like them to be they don't necessarily need to talk to me but i like being touched so like having my back rubbed or like just their body against mine so if we're spooning or something like that it's really nice use the term aftercare aftercare yeah I love that term. yeah can so you, some can people, you talk about that a little bit yeah some people say they don't need it and some people do some tops also need aftercare but it's basically the taking care of you post whatever you've been doing so that could be like once you're getting untied or coming off of like this wherever you were being um spanked or having your scene with the impact player whatever it is it's like making you okay giving you water sometimes you might need a snack because your blood sugar can drop things can happen because again all of this stuff is happening with your body um and some people do need like to be in a blanket and curled up some people don't need that some people like walk away and they're like i'm good and they kind of take care of themselves um but it's it's really kind of personal to what people might need some people need quiet they might need to be like in a quiet corner. They might need reassurance, um, depending on like how deep of a protocol you're doing. It's like, was I good? You know, was I a good girl? Was I a good boy? Did I do good for you? Like all these things that reassurance that like, especially when it comes to pain, because if you tap out or you do your you safe word or you, if you feel like you're struggling to to stay in it, and a lot of times that can bring up feelings of failure after because if your dynamic with your top is that they give pain and you receive it and they're like doing different things to give you pain and if you feel like you couldn't take it or the you were endurance wasn't enough. yeah and it, yeah. but it can make you feel like you've let them down if you safe word out or you or like if you felt like the struggle like it was like i couldn't do it like you know you have a workout and you like normally can run so many miles on the treadmill and then you had that day where just for whatever reason you couldn't and like how shitty you feel because it you know you're like you know you're fine and that you usually run this and there's probably all these other reasons why you couldn't but you feel like a failure a little bit that same shit happens mm -hmm. and so it's nice to be reassured and you know all those things are part of aftercare and sometimes aftercare needs to stretch days after because people can experience what we call drop um and drop happens to I think everybody and then we just don't muggles don't call it that <laughs> muggles. yeah because you don't it's like if you go like after vacation and you come back and you feel a little depressed even though yeah. you might have, you go to Disney World you have an amazing time or you get married and like after like your honeymoon people come back and they have like a little blue the blues it's drop you're dropping you've like had a dopamine like, drop yeah, yeah that's exactly what it is it's dropping but so kink folks have a phrase for it so you know it's coming mm -hmm. and a lot of people will prepare for it so for me because like now my daddy he's long distance we see each other a lot but he is not here so like after visits we make sure we're talking to each other, that we're con still connecting, that we might have like a 
face-to-face call like a you know FaceTime or something scheduled so we can talk hear each other's voices and see each other's faces um it might you might need a day of like watching a movie curled up and eating something that makes you feel good and treating yourself taking a bath it's it's you might need to heighten up on your like self-care to like help you get over that hump so aftercare is in the moment ooh, in the moment and then it slides out until you know the times after you talked about the euphoria that you experience as a sub mm-hmm. i'm curious what you know about the the inflictors inflictors yeah, yeah. dom oh, yeah so, doms yeah, yeah doms yeah like um, what what their yeah what their pleasure is yeah i don't like, I don't, I don't know if there's like a same kind of, oh, like we call it subspace when you hit that euphoria and you start getting to the place where you can't, you're just in a whole other realm. I don't know if doms go there because of course I'm, I'm not a top and that's not how I experience my pleasure. Um, but I do know that like what I've, from my own personal doms, that there is this level of like, enjoyment and especially around like certain acts that they really enjoy so um my current person really loves bites and like leaving marks and so when he knows he's left a mark or like the second or third time we're having sex and he sees like an old mark and he's like oh that looks so good and so there's this whole like other bit of pleasure coming from that you can take so much pain like I had a top for a while and I'll get the difference between tops and like a dom so a top might just be a person that you don't have like a deep linked protocol type relationship with it might be a person who is dominating you for like a period of time and you're not like interlaced emotionally I for and that's what it kind of is for me like if I call you my dom we have some kind of working relationship that's a little deeper tops are people that like almost provide a service same thing with bottom so if you're a bottom like I will bottom for people we're not really in a relationship but like you will like um, have a friend who kicks my cunt all the time and she's the person that I experienced with that with first and so like kicking as part of a thing and so like I bottom for her we don't have that kind of emotional yeah more casual it's casual it's like casual and Uh, so and that with that i have it set up because i get aftercare from other people because we don't have that kind of touched thing um and although she will also take care of me but it's like a little it's it is more we don't have like an ongoing thing unless we're like at the same thing at the same time um so like i had a top who would just come up with the weirdest things to hit me with like he bought a brand new bike chain and took a picture of it and was like i'm gonna hit you with this tonight and i'm like okay <laughs> but that was his thing of like mm-hmm. oh you can take this mm-hmm. and it wouldn't you know and it was like oh i want to hit you with this so mm-hmm. I, it was also finding the objects and mm-hmm. the like oh this is gonna hurt you really good and mm-hmm. i think there's different ways that they experience that kind of euphoria um especially with somebody who enjoys it enjoys the thing that they're giving yeah. It also makes me think of like different objects inflict different types of pain. Yes. Um, I'm wondering, <laughs> yeah, what what that's like, what are the differences of pain? Are there certain types of pain that you oh, enjoy yeah. and others type that you're just not interested in at all? So there's if you really want to boil it down to the simplest things, there's stingy and there's thuddy. And stingy feels cutting, um, almost like like you look and you're like am I bleeding because <laughs> that was a lot it's kind of like just sharp and thuddy has weight behind it and it hurts in a different in a deeper way you feel it more in your body and a lot of times sting will be very surface um so things like canes narrow hard items like canes and whips things like that can be stingy um floggers with lots of falls the individual strings are called falls so if they have a lot of them and they're wide it'll feel like heavy like a thump so it'll hit you and it'll just be more like a deeper muscle like hit um fist will be thuddy kicking is thuddy i prefer heavy thuddy things uh i do like some stingy things uh but stingy needs to be it's kind of that motion of moving through it so i don't want all stingy and i don't want all thuddy i want it like interdispersed and like there's in different ways Mm -hmm. um but some people have very they're like no 
I do not want stingy things. This is too much. This is too... They're only thudders. Right. Mm -hmm. They're only thudders. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for someone who's interested in BDSM, what would you recommend as like a beginner level? Where do they start? Yeah. Where do you start? Where do you start? I would get a... Where do you begin? I would get a book. There's so many books. Um, Tristan Termino wrote, what is it? The Beginner's Guide to Kink, which is a really good one. And I know pe- people are always, you always tell me to read. I'm like, yeah, because that's how I figured out I was a bottom, a submissive, because I kept reading erotica. And anytime anybody, I, I would so identify with the person being like, being yelled at or told to do something and like the dynamic around that and and i was like i like this way too much i like it way too much okay this is a dynamic i enjoy so sometimes when you're reading you're like this interests me because you need to see what might interest you so then you can go seek it out who's the character i identify with right or even and for that and the the beginner's guide to kink is really just like a glossary of terms and types of kink and different things so you can read about it and go huh that might be something i want to try like you can highlight it i always tell people highlighters are magic in these books um going to a party like experimenting and going to an event that you know is going to be kinky um where you can observe people and or going to a, a conference where there'll be talks about kink so I, I love them because you'll get little workshops about different types of kink that you can go sit in and learn about it and some might be over your head because it might be geared towards somebody deeper into it but you can go like I learned about fire play and cupping and I've learned about bondage and stuff and it's not necessarily stuff I do but it was neat to learn about it and to hear somebody talk about it because then you can go like oh does that resonate with me did that make me really want to try i mean that was why i even tried like electrocution play because i was at a conference and i was like this seems very interesting and and like something i want to try and they had all the tools out and they were letting people kind of uh experiment with it with somebody who knew what they were doing and that was so i i love stuff like that because you kind of get immersed in it um it might that going to an event might be overwhelming if you're not like an outgoing extroverted type person Uh, but that is a good way to start figuring stuff out finding a class about something that sounds interesting Um, and if you're nervous about going to events and things like that uh, Molina Williams Haas and Harrington I can't remember their first name but they wrote a book called playing well with others Mm. and it's all about it's like it's a glossary of terms it talks about like uh, going to a party or an event and like the different types you might go to and like what your what you would wear um, what you like your hygiene like making sure things are done or like don't like cover yourself in perfume because that's not you know you're going to be in an enclosed space and that could bother some people but it just kind of gives you a rundown and it's not a thick book but I always recommend that to people because it's like I want to go to a sex party or I want to go to an event but I don't know I've never been to one I don't know it's scary it's scary and so it's kind of like this like you can read it and feel like you at least know what you're walking into so like they talk about flagging and what the because flagging you can flag with like pieces of clothing or scarves hankies what's flagging they're different colors uh coded to mean something so like a a yellow hanky could mean you're into p play and depending on if it's on the left or the right side of your pocket it's whether you're into giving or receiving Mm. um some people flag with fingernail polish and there's so there's different types of ways to flag so you should read it because you may accidentally be flagging. right no, you no. might be flagging something you don't know you're flagging yeah. or you might be like why is this person wearing this thing or and I don't know yeah. so I like it because if you want to go to a party and you have nobody else in your life to talk to it kind of gives you a primer it'll tell you like even dress code like most kink stuff will tell you uh fetish wear or something or black all black so it'll tell you like oh this is the kind of stuff you should do Mm -hmm. and i think that's helpful because like for me i was like a babe in the woods and i was i discovered kink on twitter (laughs) like Mm -hmm. really i was following people and then people were talking about things and i started looking into the books and then the books begat the going to events and things and like figuring stuff out so it's a process it's not it's not a i'm suddenly in it and i'm or i'm suddenly kinky or i'm not it's it's a process and it's patience 
And if you're in a relationship and you're really interested in experimenting and exploring kink or BDSM mm-hmm. and your partner is not on the same page, I mean, how do you recommend exploring it? Oh, I think it's worth talking about it and like rounding up your resources. So if you are reading a book, um, maybe sharing that book with your partner and maybe not having them read the whole book, but if you've highlighted some passages and you're like, hey, these are things that I'm excited about, how do you feel about it? Uh, There's also this really great um, thing called a yes, no, maybe list. There's so many different kinds. The kind I like the most is by Bex Caputo for Bex Talk Sex. It's very in depth. Um, And it has all these different things that some of the other ones don't have. But basically, it lists different acts. And it's like, are you into it? Yes, no, maybe. Um, But it's a good way to kind of sit down with your partner. And you would each fill it out. And then you trade papers. So you kind of don't, you get to see like, oh, you wrote yes about a thing I wrote yes about. And maybe we wouldn't have said that to each other. But I can see it now. And like, oh, we could talk about this. And we could go like, oh, why aren't you into this? Or, oh, you're a maybe about this thing. And it could also be where maybe you might be compatible. So that's a way. If you have a partner who is no way, shape, or form interested in this at all, but is, you know, maybe on board with you experimenting, um, there's a book. It's, I think it's called When Someone You Love Is Kinky. <laughs> <laughs> I forget who wrote it, but it's something, it's kind of like a primer for like, hey, so somebody you know is into this thing, and here they're not, you know, it's not a dangerous they're not putting themselves in danger they're not you know um they're not out of their minds or you know right, like kind of softening their strong yeah reaction. well because a lot of people have a lot of like well you'd like to be hit and they have that thing of like what's wrong with you right mm-hmm. you know what did what happened to you so it kind of helps with that i think it's also kind of important to re- be patient that sometimes we are springing things on our partners that they're like where did this even come from <laughs> like whoa oh. um but having those conversations and like i'd remind people that kink doesn't have to be deeply like sexual in that it doesn't have to be genitals touching and like you don't have to even kiss so you could go and be there for your partner while they experience something and you could be part of their aftercare and you can connect with them by taking care of them afterwards if they're into certain types of play that maybe you're not into Um, which I know plenty of couples who are like that who are just you know they don't play together because the other person's not really kinky but they'll be a part of their aftercare and helping them with things so there's a wide range of possibilities there's so many kink. things yeah yeah that's so many seems important to remember yeah so this is a more general question but as a sex educator what do you think are the ingredients to a satisfying sex life or what do you Ooh. feel like people should be doing more of talking to each other communication <laughs> it is it's key because oh, we get so caught up in our heads about how do i tell somebody something or uh, why don't they know also you know people aren't mind readers i think that's a very important thing to remember and sometimes you do have to tell people things and there's a lot of this misconception that you're the right person should just know and if they don't know then they're not a good lover or not the right person and it's like no sometimes you happen upon a person that lines up with you and that they receive love and give love in similar ways that you do I mean, we're lucky if that happens and sometimes it doesn't but sometimes you have to find those ways you connect and I tell people that all the time um, that if you don't talk about you know what you need you're not going to get it but also, it's knowing your own body. So I'm a big fan of masturbation for all, for all bodies. Because if you don't know how you come, nobody else is going to know how you come. And it is a thing you can't explore with a partner. But there's something about taking your time when you're not in front of somebody else and not feeling like they're pleasure depends upon your pleasure or is somehow linked and if you're having a hard day that now you've ruined the moment and so like if you're just experimenting with yourself and you can say to somebody hey this is how I you know my body works and that was really powerful for me with my sex life everything changed when I was able to say like I don't come easily um 
some of the reasons why are my trauma stuff, but some of the reasons why are like just my clitoris, she wants to be shy. Uh, so it takes me a little longer to come. Um, but I really love the act of sex and I may not have an orgasm during sex, but I am enjoying myself immensely. And it is helpful if you're okay with helping me come after you've had your orgasm. Like that is still sex for me. And so knowing that and being able to say like, hey, this is how I work. Um, but also then having a partner who might push you like my partner now has helped me move beyond like feeling like I need porn because porn was always a good mental distractor for me um trauma brain because it keeps me in the thing that's happening but also is giving my brain a place to escape and it's so we're all working together but he's helped me like oh like if he talks dirty that helps me if I can lock in a certain fantasy and he's talking dirty and he's doing these things like I can have orgasms while we're having sex or even after sex without the porn and that was a new thing I learned about myself so he helped me push the boundaries of what I thought and how like how I thought my body worked and what I thought I needed it's like I still like this thing but now I know I can like move beyond it part of that also involves you being open to it as yeah. well yeah so it's being open to those things and right. not being you know, being open to if someone needs toys or just being open to like a sex act that somebody might enjoy, being open to exploring and oh, just don't pressure, don't, you know, be patient. So it's like, put it out there. You might get a no and it's like, hey, I'm curious about this. I would love to do this with you. And it might be a no, it's like, okay. And then maybe you're like, hey, I know you said no, but like for that in that moment, but I was still thinking about it. And I was like, is there, would you want to like maybe start with like a, with like fingers or a toy? Or is there another way maybe we could explore this that is in a different way? And then if it's still a no, sometimes you have to let it go. And it may come back around. The person may just not like, oh, I, I may want to do this. I may want to try it. But putting it out there, even if it's going to be a no, it's like putting it on the table, even if it's a no, because then it's out in the air that you like this thing mm -hmm. and that you're into this thing yeah, I think yeah. that's great advice so what projects are you involved with now or on the horizon on the horizon so I'm still working on sex at a go go we have a show on August 28th here in New York at caveat um, I just wrapped a web series called sex props with Francisco Ramirez and we're it's called we just go around New York helping New Yorkers solve their sex problems with sex advice interior design and a sex toy too so cool. where can they yeah. find this that's on youtube um and it was produced by new york magazine's the cut so but all the episodes are on youtube right now and we have a kink episode where we help someone figure out like what kind of kink they might be and we like made over their apartment a little bit to be a fun kinky space but that their mom could come to and they don't have to run around <laughs> hiding things um, i'm very proud of it it was a very fun episode to do and it was great because it we got to help somebody like narrow down how they what how their kink might right. be their kinks and what they and a might lot of be. people can learn from that too yeah and uh, and we do a yes no maybe list all three of us together we're sitting on a couch doing a yes no maybe list so it's a it's a fun episode um, and then my kink kit is coming out so I have a spanking kit with the kink kit folks it's so hard to say that <laughs> the kink <laughs> kit um, and I really like it because I am a fan of I like being people's gateway drug I say that I'm like the I want to be your gateway sex education drug like I, I'm not an expert expert in everything but I know a lot about a lot of different things and so if I can pique your curiosity to where you're wanting to step into something and learn more about it that makes me so happy and that's why I really love the kink kit folks because they do that they're like here's your little pool where you can dip your toe in to different types of kink um, and we're going to give you a guide and we're going to help you find your way so you don't have to go like I don't know how to set up a scene or I don't know how to do this or like we have positions for the spanking and we have like we're even going to have like a, a, a guide to what to be looking for when you spank um, as far as skin color and things and like safety and what to avoid and you know uh, just all kinds of and aftercare like mm -hmm. after spanking aftercare which we actually teamed up with the butters and we have like a 
cream you can massage in post spanking that if you are a person who bruises easily it'll help with that too so oh wow so it's really yeah it's it's curated there's a guide yeah Yeah. and you get tools so you get like a nice paddle we have some things for sensation play because i i like that as part of spanking too that it doesn't have to all be hitting it can be like tickles and different Mm. feels Uh, so yeah and are there other kits available yes so they do an art of touch um there is a trauma kit so sex after trauma which is super important because people do get to a point where they want to start experiencing their sexual sides and their sexual selves and i love the kit because it really helps partners who may be at a loss as how to reconnect with their partner so it's kind of like here's some tools here are some tips here's some games here are some things you can do um and it just really gives people this like container to experiment with and lots of resources as to like you know if you're here we get it and now like here's where you can go beyond this yeah Yeah. so helpful yeah yeah all right well thank you so much thank you for having me this was great illuminating interview thank you thank you Mm-hmm.